tis the season for protesting and policing. I mean, it's always that season, but this time we get it with chestnuts and cocoa. Hey guys, I'm Sana, and today we're looking at why the police love a good old fashioned crackdown of a protest, and it's in two parts. In the first part of this video, I'm gonna talk about four things that go into a police crackdown of a protest. And in part two, I'm gonna dive a bit into the history of why the police do what they do. Hint, it involves eugenics and the Spanish-American War of 1898. Didn't see that coming, did you? The policing of protests in the United States has, like Khloe Kardashian and Simon Cowell, seen a lot of faces. Up until the 1980s, there was the big stick approach, which sounds tantalizing, but was basically about beating the protests out of people. Then we saw a shift towards what was called negotiated management. That's when the police would talk to protesters before the actual protest, see what their needs were, give them a permit. Sounds like a healthy relationship, but it was actually so toxic. And that strategy was to mitigate the outcome of a protest by controlling and knowing as much as possible beforehand. And then there were a group of anti-capitalist heroes at the 1999 Seattle WTO protest who decided they weren't interested in negotiating with the cops anymore and... You will be subject to arrest. That led to the strategic incapacitation approach, which coincidentally is what I call my game plan for whenever someone wants to hang out in the middle of this pandemic. We're not doing it guys, stay home. Now, strategic incapacitation is really a rebranding of the big stick approach, but with something a little extra. This approach was really formed by 9-11 because the underlying philosophy of strategic incapacitation was the idea of securitizing society. In other words, increase surveillance, control public spaces, and preemptively arrest people in order to stop any societal disruption. This is the same time we see police departments become more militarized, taking on not only the look of a military, but the tactics, approach, rhetoric, and weapons. And so when it comes to protests, protesters weren't seen as a group of people exercising their First Amendment rights, but as a potential mob with the potential to create and cause a lot of instability and violence. So what does that look like in practice? It's actually a very bureaucratic process, readily available in playbooks online for free. It's free, it's all free, it's available online. But I'm gonna sum it up in four parts that are fundamental to every police crackdown of a protest. It all starts days before. The police are already head in surveilling community organizers and movements, gathering intelligence, often with the help of the FBI. Protest leaders are identified, other departments with mass demonstration experience are contacted for advice, and certain uh, resources are stocked up on. Then there's the command structure that's put in place to ensure quick and efficient decision making and action on the day of. The structure is made up of three levels, strategic, operational, and tactical. Stay with me, stay with me. The strategic level is responsible for overseeing the whole event. The operational level is responsible for overseeing the deployment of forces. And the tactical level is responsible for the application and distribution of resources on the ground during the event itself. Tactical is the front line. These are the guys you're coming face to face with at a protest. Each level has a commander. And yes, they're very heavy on the military terms. And I'll explain this in part two. The strategic commander makes all the decisions. And while the tactical team already knows the game plan and goals on the ground beforehand, the operational commander will let them know of any changes or decisions. Now, I know that's a lot of dense information, but that chain of command is actually why those frontline cops and riot gear can't and won't stop arrests, even if you show them your press pass as a journalist. I'm sorry? You're under arrest. Okay. Do you mind telling me why I'm under arrest, sir? Why, why am I under arrest, sir? because it's not their decision to make. The decision has already been made by the strategic or operational commander. Who knew cracking the skulls of protesters and encroaching on free speech and free press could be so bureaucratic, but it is. Now, while all of this is happening, there's a lot more happening elsewhere. Police departments employ a variety of tactics to control protesters, short of arresting them, from jamming communications in a given area to a tactic called kettling, which sounds cute, but actually is derived from a German military term, and that's not a good start. 
Kettling is when the police block off streets and push protesters, I mean, trap them really, into a confined area. And then they surround them, keeping them there for hours until deciding to let them out. Sounds okay-ish when it's put that way until you realize that a heavily armed state-funded force is trapping civilians into a confined space without access to anything like bathrooms, food, and water for hours. And civil rights groups say that it also restricts First and Fourth Amendment rights while heightening tension rather than diffusing it. Can become the mob if we make you the mob. So what happens to all the arrested protesters? Well, it depends on what the police department's goal is with the protests, how many precincts are available, the district attorney's criminal justice philosophy, and if you're right or left wing. Some protesters get let go, never being charged or spending time in jail, whereas others go through the whole process of being charged, jailed, and arraigned. Now, despite police departments facing lawsuits across the country for their handling of protests, it doesn't seem much will be changing anytime soon. In fact, what we see is a worsening of police brutality towards protesters. This is in large part because militarization, viewing civilians as potential enemy combatants, and the ideology of law and order at any cost is tied deeply to the DNA of the American policing structure. Hello and welcome to part two. Glad you stayed or glad you skipped ahead because you're such a history nerd. We love it. So policing forces have existed in the United States since the 17th century. And initially they weren't the formalized, centralized institutions of violent law and order we've come to ACAB today. They were communal and informal night watchmen, usually. Sounds cute, but in the South, these forces were actually slave patrols in charge of enforcing slavery laws, and they had a lot of unchecked power to do their job. Mm, sounds familiar. The first formalized police institutions started popping up in the late 1800s in cities like New York and Boston. Their goals were pretty simple. Stop crime, get the bad guys, and keep society orderly and peaceful. But this was also following an influx of immigrants from Ireland and Germany who were, surprise surprise in the never ending story of this country, seen as a threat to the American way of life as defined by the English and Dutch settlers. Fast forward a couple decades into the 20th century and we get federal and state police departments too, so even more formalized, more structured. That's when this guy, August Vollmer, came in to change the face of what was then still a fresh approach to law enforcement. Called the father of modern policing, the first Berkeley police chief saw crime prevention as a matter of effective community management versus an exercise in violence and punitive justice. For him, it was about preventing crime, not just arresting people. Vollmer was the first to mount his entire department and integrate scientific investigation into policing. He developed police training schools and hired the first black and woman police officers in the country. He also introduced uniforms, badges, and chains of command. But Vollmer injected a little something else into policing, the ideas of degeneracy and the police as a militarized force. See, Vollmer was a committed believer in eugenics, which informed his criminal justice philosophy. He taught courses on how hereditary and racial degeneracy led to crime and the decay of society. Vollmer had also served on a policing force in the Philippines during the Spanish-American War of 1898. And this experience led to his belief that a military mindset, training, and set of tactics could help police forces stop degeneracy and the, quote, enemies of society. And so policing, per Vollmer's philosophy, was like a counterinsurgency during a state of war. And it's kind of hard to divorce violence from war. And it's also hard to divorce his criminal justice philosophy, which was rooted in eugenics, from his militaristic approach to policing. Because in a war, you're on the lookout for enemy combatants, or quote, enemies of society, as Vollmer put it. And if the belief is that certain groups of people defined by race, are more prone to violence, crime, and general degeneracy? Well, who becomes the enemy of society? The enemy combatant? Throughout the history of the American police structure, we've seen an evolution towards the militarization that's plastered across our feeds and screens today. It's not new, but it has gotten worse decade by decade, as police have been given more power, more weapons, and less boundaries. So there you have it. 
The police suppression of protests and the brutality we've become so familiar with aren't rogue acts, but acts that represent how the structure of policing in this country has been built. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video and how it's kind of a double feature. Let us know in the comments what you thought about that, what else you want us to cover, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. We'll see you very soon.